Hello, welcome to the first ever live recording of the Lacrosse Show, hosted on the Lacrosse Network. I want to thank Samir and the guys for having us on. I'm Connor Wilson from Lex All Stars. Uh, joining me is Mark Powers, as always. Good to see you, Mr. Powers. How are things? I'm good. I'm good. How about yourself? Can't complain. Uh, living the life, you know. Uh, why don't you let uh, let people know where you're coming from, Mark? Uh, live from uh, the Upper East Side of Manhattan right now. Hoity toity. Wow. Samir, coming out from California, right? Yep, coming out from Southern California, from Los Angeles. Uh, it's pretty frigid over here, Connor. When you say frigid, <laughs> how cold is that really? It's cold. I think it was a, a cool 60 today. Which was okay, tough. don't talk. Don't talk to me. Do your yeah, I'm just saying it's. I wore my uh, <laughs> wore my winter jacket today. Yeah, we we had intermittent snow showers today, so. <laughs> yeah, what about yourself. <laughs> So the context here is, uh, you know, we're obviously here to, to talk about lacrosse, and we want to know what you guys want to talk about uh, for those of you who are out there listening. So Samir will be be our uh, Tony Reale, if you will, interacting with fans and uh, posing questions and, you know, kind of bringing a little bit of that live element into the show. Uh, Mark and I will kind of jabber our jaws off about lacrosse. It's uh, what we think we do best, so we're going to stick to that. First topic uh, I want to hit up, obviously, uh, you know, I just put a post up on this about uh, on Lax All-Stars. Uh, two new stick rules. One for me is this uh, three and a half inch diameter butt end, and that, that's kind of your max size you can have of a shaft now. Uh, sorry, that's a circumference, three and a half inch circumference around the shaft. So that kind of eliminates all these donuts. And my real question about that, I mean, I, I don't really have a problem with eliminating donuts, but my question is, you know, can guys even use butt end caps anymore? You know, if a shaft is already three and a half inches around and you can't put more tape on it, can you really afford to put a butt end shaft, you know, cap on it? And and I think that's a kind of a weird change and it does seem like a bit of a safety issue. You know, you don't want to have kind of exposed metal edges at the bottom of sticks. Well, you're exactly right. And, and from what I understand, there used to be a rule at least that you had to have an end cap. In fact, you couldn't even use tape to cover the edges, so I, I think this rule is a little either miswritten. I mean, I looked through the I looked through the, the rules book for this year and actually didn't see a mention of a of an end cap anywhere. I mean, it's 85 pages, so I certainly could have missed something. But I mean, I I read it through for you know a good 30, 45 minutes looking for mentions of butt end caps, and I, I didn't really come across any. So maybe they've just done away with that all in all. Well, like I remember a couple of years ago when uh, when the beer caps, you know, substituting as end caps really came in vogue, and they had to specifically mention, you know, that you couldn't do that. So <laughs> they had to be rubber. Yeah. Right. It had to be rubber. It had to be protective. Um, so yeah, you're right. It, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, I and mean, I'm just you know curious if an exemption will be pulled out. I mean, I think that could simply be solved by allowing players to have a four inch circumference you know, butt end cap and tape application on their sticks. You know, that kind of gets rid of that issue. Now, what do you think of the spirit spirit of this change really was? Do you think that, I mean, I you know, in my opinion, it's got to have to do with people kind of taping that huge donut about an inch or two up on the shaft to kind of play as if it's shorter. I'm assuming that that's what they were trying to legislate against here, but I don't know. I mean, I guess it's maybe me being a defender and being a little naive to this, but I don't understand the advantage that's being gained there. So, you know, I also was a defender in college. Thankfully, I've moved on uh, and, and started playing attack, and, and I have a donut at the bottom of my stick. Now, I don't have it there to shorten my stick specifically. I guess right. that that is kind of a secondary, uh, you know, factor that comes out of it. I, I have it there because I like to, you know, really nestle that against the bottom of, you know, my hand right here, and I feel like that gives me a little extra torque when I'm shooting. So for me, that's my guess, is that they were trying to get away from uh, stick modifications that actually gave a player some sort of inherent advantage. Uh, that seems to be what, what the, a lot of the intent was. So, you know, again, I don't know what it was for, but I, I think that that was it. Um, probably also to keep players from, you know, shortening up the stick. Um, again, you're modifying equipment that are kind of set to standards. So uh, just, just to bring in a, a couple of our viewers, wanted to thank everybody for tuning in right now. Um, we do have uh, somebody watching from Australia who says greetings from Australia. So, good day. Australia. Oh, good day, everybody. And uh, a question here that came in regarding, 
Yeah. A question that came in regarding the shaft is, do you think they will measure the actual shaft and not count the butt end? That's a good question, and they might. I mean, uh, that could certainly be an exemption. You know, you could say that it, it's the metal part of the shaft, and a, and a standard, they could then define a standard butt end cap can be used. Uh, you know, you could also get around it by changing the three and a half inches to four inches. Wouldn't give uh, anybody a huge donut, but it would allow for, you know, uh, you to have a butt end of your stick. So, I mean, there's clearly an answer. It's it's not an impossible situation to solve, um, and it might be solved already. I mean, there a memo came out Friday uh, to D1 coaches, you know, changing some of the rules and, and making some adjustments, and we don't necessarily hear about that immediately. So, you know, th this right. problem may be being addressed already. I've got a call into John Hine, the chair of the Rules Committee, so I'm hoping to talk with him tomorrow and uh, we'll have more information on that. You know what, and see, seeing how he's kind of handled this rule situation, considering the obvious ambiguity that exists now with, with these kind of recent changes, I, I would imagine that he'd get back to you guys pretty quickly and this will be resolved before the next round of games gets started. Yeah, I mean, Justin Skaggs from Style and Strings uh, was in contact with John Hine while these rules were being discussed. Uh, said he was very receptive uh, to comments and input, and that you know he was really forthcoming with information and, and pretty clear on why they were trying things and what they hoped right. to accomplish. You know, overall, considering how much change happened this year, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the way that the rules committee went about it. You know, do I think that some timetables could have been extended and changes could have been made earlier or late? Yes, of course. You know, you can nitpick anything, but overall, I, th I think the rules were done pretty well. Um, maybe with the possible exception of this this next change <laughs> that, that I'm going to bring up, and that's the no back test. Okay, so there's no more back test. You used to have to put the ball in the back of the head and then put it upside down. If the ball didn't fall out, it was an illegal stick, right? So that was a new rule for this year, and that's been scrapped. So actually, yeah, okay. Kevin... Kevin Rowan uh, came in with a question here, and I'm assuming this is the answer now. He, he says, any official update for the, uh, for the MCLA about the elimination of the stick check with the ball in the back of the stick? So that's exactly what you're talking about, right, Connor? Yeah. I think if the MCLA plans on following, uh, you know, kind of in step lock with, uh, with the NCAA, then... Which they do. Yeah, yeah, then they should lose that rule as well. I mean, I think they made an exemption one year on uniform number sizes, Right, because it would be a prohibitive cost burden for every team to re-outfit their uh, their uniforms. But you know, for the most part, I think with, with the exception of that one example, the MCLA almost always uh, pretty much stays right in touch with the NCAA rules. So I, I would expect that that's going to be true for them as well, and was on was on Friday. Although I'm sure that some refs maybe didn't get that memo, and some MCLA coaches maybe didn't get that memo. Um, so maybe the rules hadn't you know officially been changed. I mean, that. Any time you have rule changes that happen this late, I think you're going to run into some of those issues. Um, they're unfortunate, you know. But if if that one issue decides a game for you, I don't know. Maybe so. You Connor, so, so what's your big beef with the elimination of the back check? So the back check. Well, here's the thing. You know, I I actually wasn't a huge fan of them getting rid of the U and V shooting string. I, I don't believe that the shooting strings themselves are the problem. You know, they're more of a guiding. Thing you know, it's a last-minute touch you put on a stick. You know, ideally, when you string a pocket, right, you should be able to throw without shooting strings in it, and then you put shooting strings in it to really finalize you know where the ball is going. Um, so I didn't have a huge problem with the shooting strings. I thought the back test was the best because then you can have those side walls on the inside of you know the head of uh, of the face of the head, and that really creates that that narrow pocket inside a 2010 spec head, right? So you can have a pre-2010 spec width pocket in your stick if you don't have that back check. Um, so for me, that was the most telling, you know, and creative rule change. I loved it. I thought it was, and it was so simple. You know, you didn't need you didn't need a measuring tape to see if it were four inches. You di you didn't need any of that. All you had to do was put the ball in the back of the head and turn it over. Did that work? Yes. Okay. Illegal. You know, I mean, it was so simple. I, yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, I mean, I guess I, I just kind of think that it's it's not necessarily the most perfect metric. You know, it's not like busting out a tape measure. I don't know that and, there is a perfect metric, though, right? Uh, I don't know that there is a perfect metric. No, no, of course, but but you know, for example, when we're talking about the other rules, and you're talking about you know the shooting strings being four inches down from the uh, you know the the scoop, or you know you're talking about the length of the stick, 
or you're even talking about the specific head dimensions, at least there's something, you know, definitively quantifiable there, whereas, you know, something that's much more unscientific, just, oh, the ball doesn't come out when I turn it over. I mean, you know me, I, I play with a pretty unscientific pocket, you know, no well, channel, no nothing, and, you know, I was trying to do this. that's the whole myself. point, huh? right? That's the, that's the entire point right there, is what? does the ball come out of the stick? If the ball doesn't come out of the stick, you've got black hole pockets, you got players who can just, you know, swim, dodge, and power cradle their way See, through. See, I don't, I don't agree with that. And that See, was the problem. Nah, because to me, like, I, I definitively have a stick that wouldn't be quantified as a black hole pocket. I mean, you, you've seen the sticks that I play with. And, yeah, yeah. you know, it, it's an issue where it just happens to get stuck in the back. I, I can't speak intelligently about why it is, but, you know, if this was the type of pocket they were trying to legislate against, I don't necessarily understand what the issue is. And, and clearly that's my own... You know, individual problem and in, uh, you know uh, perception on the thing, but I, I don't you know, necessarily have as big of an issue. With this. You bring up a great point. I think it's why people were so up in arms. You know, it, this all this stuff is not all mutually exclusive or inclusive. You know, right. your stick may fail a test, but really be legal and within the spirit of the rules. Exactly. And that's the hard thing. You know, that's a hard that's a hard thing you have to do any time regulation is required to change something. You know, regulation can never outpace innovation, right? I mean, it's reactive. Oh, for you sure. You know, so it's kind of sad. So you, ha yeah, so you have to make those rules that may be a little too harsh just to make sure that you're catching some of the most, you know, flagrant abusers of the current setup. Agreed, agreed. And, and I'd even agree with your point that, you know, the channeling ultimately makes a bigger difference than the shooting strings do. But at the same time, I'm going to disagree with your earlier contention that, you know, getting rid of the V and the U isn't going to have as much of a pronounced difference because I think it will, and I mean, you've already kind of seen that. Um, you know, I mean, granted, it's a really limited sample size, but in the in the only televised game that we've seen so far, the Loyola game. Yeah, no, I think their their passing was certainly crisper, and I think uh, quite a bit of that can be attributed to the new uh, to the new stick rules. Right. So we have a a, a couple. Uh, Couple new viewers tuning in again. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We've got to give a shout out to Athens Drive High School Lacrosse. So there's your shout out. Um, Where's that? Georgia? Georgia. Where is that? It's like yeah. in Georgia. We got a, uh, a Andrew Williams tuning in. He says that uh, he plays MCLA, and his coach told him that they were following all MCLA rules. MCLA rules. They, you know, as we talked about, they do mirror the NCAA rules. Um, and let's see. Mr. Lackstrings wants to know what rules do you think will affect the most uh, most players in lacrosse next year? Great question. Great yeah. question. Uh, yeah, Mr. Lackstrings, only only with the sticks or, or all rules in general? <laughs> right. So let's let's uh, let's get into that once we hear from you, Mr. Lackstrings, and uh, we're, we're going to do an, another shout out here to Arrowhead High School Lacrosse. Um, and let's see, do, a question here from Tyler Walsh. Do you think high school players should start using NCAA stringing rules? That's an That's interesting cool question way. about, you know, seniors in high school, and, and uh, I'm curious to hear what you guys have to say about that. I've kind of been wondering that myself, you know, wh what the deal is there. You know, to my knowledge, I think the MIAA down in Baltimore is the only league that fully takes on all the NCAA rules, and, I mean, clearly they're a producer of, you know, tons of top talent. But I find it weird, you know, when I see kids – especially face-off players and the like, you know, that, that are using sticks that aren't necessarily NCAA legal and, and obviously, you know, being successful with them and, you know, how much of their success is, is, is intrinsic to the equipment they're using. It, it's certainly a good question. And, you know, if for, for my money, I, I would probably say that it, it would be best for them to start utilizing NCAA equipment, um, especially considering what we were just talking about, how, how different it is than, than what it used to be. Um, you know, it's only going to serve you well, you know, whether or not it's required and whether or not you're giving up an advantage in doing so, you know, is another issue. But, you know, I, I think in the interest of truly preparing yourself and then kind of with that giving NCAA coaches, I guess, a clear picture of what your skills are going to be like when you're playing for them, you know, I, I'd certainly advocate for the college rules. What do you think, Connor? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that Texas – or at least some portions of, of schools in Texas may also play NCAA rules. And I think there are, there are a couple others that might sneak in there as well, especially schools that, uh, or states that don't have state-sanctioned sanc lacrosse yet. Um, yeah, I, that's I think a, a lot point. of those. Yeah, they, they sometimes tend to go to NCAA rules. 
you know, one issue obviously is that uh, you have high school legal heads, and you actually, you know, you can't use a college legal head in an NFHS sanctioned game, uh, or at least one that plays under the NFH NFHS rules. So, you know, you could do that with a universal stick. However, uh, you know, the Eastern Core is a stick that I've been using a lot lately, and that's a universal head. It's legal for college and high school. And uh, you know, to be honest, maybe it's because I'm old. That, you know, I blame that on everything, but. <laughs> I kind of like a universal head. I like it a little wider. You know, I can string a, a Me nice in a pocket with mesh or traditional, but I like a little bit of a wider head. Um, you know, and I think that that does actually prepare you. You know, if your goal is to go on and play in college and be a good player, you probably want to start adjusting to the way that they play as soon as you can um, and focus less on being a good high school player. So, you know, if, if glory is your uh, is your goal, maybe – Maybe stick with a high school head, but you know if you're looking to prepare yourself truly, you know for the next level, uh, you know I think a, a universal head is really the way to go. So uh, on that same topic, we got a great question here from Jackson Parker, and I think that it kind of helps us uh, segue into some of the other topics for today. But how will these new stick rules affect Canadians coming into the college game? I would say that they won't at all. Um. You know, Canadians aren't getting by on stick stringing. They're getting by on stick skills. Right. I'd Mark? agree with that. I, I don't think it'll affect them much. You know, the old adage, it's the wizard, not the wand, certainly holds true. And I think it almost, I'd almost it would even further hold true for Canadians that <laughs> the superior stick skills. But uh, time will tell, I guess, right? I yeah, guess. I'm, Actually, I'm not particularly worried about any, you know, highly skilled finisher, scorer, dodger, Carrier, passer, right. Any, anybody want, is one of those guys who's not just an athlete. Like, you know, I'm not worried about the skill guys, and I'm not particularly right. worried about the athletes either. I think that they'll be just fine as well. Well, what's interesting about the uh, the Canadian players in, in general is that, in my experience, most Canadian players play with with a high pocket and about four shooters straight across the top. So the elimination of the V or the U, I think, will affect them less than it would. You know, American players that generally rely on that that P thirty four, whatever you know, that standard two U to nylon pocket is. I think the no, Canadians, you know, probably will will feel less of a difference, especially now with this most recent change. You know, having the channel being uh, being reinstated, so I'm I'm sure there's going to be no difference for them. Yeah. But uh, well, I wanted to go back real quick to that that question that I think it was Lackstrings had about what rule you thought would have the most impact. Um, you know, and, and let's put everything on the table, yeah. Connor. What do you think? Which of the changes do you think is going to have the most impact? Whether it's the stick rules or the uh, the pace of play stuff, which would you point yeah. to as being the uh, the biggest change? Well, I, you know, I, I do like the change uh, for the stall warning to try a shot clock out. I think it's a good middle ground, a good right. way to experiment with it as well. You know, I really don't think that that's going to come into play all that much more than the stall warning did in the past. And I think it's still going to be problematic, and each ref and crew is going to call it differently. So I don't see that one as a big change. The sticks, again, you know, like we said, skill is skill. I don't see a big change there. Um, you know, I think the quick restarts are, are something that people will adapt to pretty easily, but the sideline horns, for me, that's by far and away the biggest change. Uh, for the I last couple so. of years, you know, because of the sideline horn, you've been able to sub – Offensive players off, defensive players on much more readily. You've been able mm -hmm. to, you know, not only have guys specialized. That's an that's an issue. That's a that's part of it. But I think the bigger part is you were able to have guys train to go for 45 second to a minute and 15 to two minute bursts. You know, your midfielders, your offensive middies, they really had to be able to go hard. You know, maybe make one really good dodge and then sprint back off the field. Now I think that that conditioning aspect comes back into things, and you know while that four four forty is still valuable, um, you don't get the chance to necessarily set that up as much when you're fresh. I think you know a lot of guys are going to have coming on uh, after playing a little defense or clearing the ball. Doing you know, that endurance, right? Yeah, so I think it, 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 team conditioning and, and how teams approach the game because of no no horns. For me, I think that that's really a, a the biggest change, and one I'm excited to see. I, I don't think it's, it's going to ruin the game. Um, could create yeah. some really weird transition, you know, creations. Um, you know, teams coming out of these kind of positions where they they don't have players that are necessarily used to that, or what, they see a guy who's gassed on the other team and they just push it against him. Uh, I think it could could really lend itself to some exciting up and down lacrosse. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that to an extent. Um, you know, to me, I, I have a different change in mind. But one thing that I that I did want to bring up that I found kind of interesting, I was reading Quint's column where he was talking about you know uh, rolling with Mark Dixon and doing the UMBC uh, scrimmage. And my impression from the whole point of having the balls on the sidelines and the quick restarts was basically you know doing what Steel Stanwick always tried to do, which was kind of roll into the restart. And now you know, in reading Quint's article, it sounds like you can't roll into it right away. In fact, you have to come onto the field, get the attention of the referee, signify that you're ready, and then proceed with play, which, you know, you might think that's not a big deal. It is. And also, from what I was reading, he was saying that there's no longer five yards. But, you know, if you're within five yards at the time of the restart, you're not allowed to make a play on the ball. So you talk about, I mean, you know, being subjective. I mean, that's that's kind of ridiculous to me. I'm, I'm a little interested to see how that'll play out. Um, what do you think about that? I, actually, I, go ahead, I, I was going to say, I think we actually saw something similar, but uh, more so in the, the, you know, with John Galloway in the USA Loyola game. Yes. Right? I mean, that, I, I, how do you, I mean, you know. I, every I single D1 goalie coach, every single D1 goalie coach worth his salt has shown all of the goalies on his roster that clip from that game 50 times by now. Right. right? And yeah, saying, of course. Because you know, there's a point where John Galloway is about to dive where you can almost see it in his eyes. I mean, obviously I don't know this, but you can like, I, I could see it in his eyes. that he was like, should I do it? Ah. Right. Meanwhile, you know, John Galloway is a D1 goalie coach at Providence and is arguably the most athletic out-of-the-cage goalie right now, maybe other than Queener. Which is, why I think, which is probably why he risked that. And, well, that and it's a scrimmage and right. you know, international rules are different. You want to show what you can do, you know. It was his first time playing it. He wasn't thinking about it. (laughs) Right. But, I mean, you know, and we're having a little fun with it, obviously. But, you know, on a serious note, I do think that that's something, you know, goalies now can't just sell out. Defenders can't do that either. They can't sell out and dive. I mean, if that puts you way out of position, you know, that's a liability. You know, to your your point about the quick restarts and, and, you know, giving guys five yards, there was already a five-yard cushion you had to give a guy. Right, so refs are accustomed to looking like, is there a five-yard cushion here? They're eliminating you that. that. You have to That's do that cool. at any reason. Right, but it's it's still there. No, right? no, no. From what from what I read from Quint, I know, it, but you can't play defense within the guy with your when you're within five yards. All I'm saying is the refs are already equipped and trained to tell is a guy five yards away from another player. If he's right, not, but what they would do is they would move you back to five yards and start the play. Now what right. they'll do is they'll start the play, and if you're within five yards, you, you can't touch the player. I mean, to me, that's a lot right. more difficult. I mean, I think you'd agree, right? I, I mean, to me, it, it, it is a change. But, you know, judging whether or not a guy is five yards away and then moving him or judging or not whether a guy is five yards away and then blowing the whistle and giving him a penalty or not, whether he plays defense, it's a, it's a similar – it's a similar amount of work. You know, I think that the D1 refs, the D1 refs, um, m- most of the guys I had as a NESCAC player in D3, I think that these are guys who are, who are more than capable of making, you know, most of these changes and, and calls. That's not a huge concern for me, you know. I'm, I'm um, interested but I do think to see that, that one. That's going to be an interesting thing to watch, though. Um, yeah. You know, and like we said, the goal thing, I mean, all these guys have to adjust to these new rules. You know, it's a pretty – substantial change and you may see a couple early season games where people make bonehead mistakes but you know that that's part of the learning curve the one the one uh, that I think is actually going to pay the uh, the or play the biggest difference it's kind of a small one but uh, I guess actually bigger uh, the box the box being lengthened and uh, you know some of the early reports talking about the scrimmages and, and even the uh, the games with Loyola and um, and USA they were talking about how coaches w- would employ some gamesmanship there, and especially when clearing, you know, since the box is that much bigger, they would send a player to each end of the box, you know, offensive and defensive, and try to, you know, either gain an advantage and basically, you know, anoint one guy number one and, and the other guy number two, and as the play is approaching the box or as as the coach makes a decision, they'll either tell player one or player two to jump on and. You know, that could that could lead to some some odd man rushes and hopefully a lot of the transition and you know kind of the point of these rules in the first place. So I'm interested to see how the the bigger box comes into play and I think that that's one of these avenues where where the the more experienced coaches or the more innovative coaches you will know, be able to get an advantage. I know that's something that we've been talking about. Yeah, I mean I think you're absolutely right. You know, I'd look for teams like Loyola to do that. Um, you know, they've been looking for advantages and ways to push the ball with odd players 
uh, at odd times. You know, get a defensive midi matched up against no midi, take them to the hopper. Um, so I think if they can get some of those and use the box kind of like uh, you would in box lacrosse to gain, you know, that 20-yard advantage. That's yeah, exactly uh, right. It's, yeah, it'll, can, it'll promote more transition. Yeah, and it's another thing to practice, and it's another sort of uncertainty for the year that the teams will face. And it, it could just not necessarily decide some games, but it could definitely impact some games, I think. Oh, for so, sure. Yeah, it's, it's – yeah. uh, you know, we had a question here, Connor. You talked about the NESCAC a little bit. Um, the question uh, about where you, huh? where you where you played in the NESCAC, uh, and then it was actually answered already by, by one of the viewers, which was Wesleyan. But I think it was actually Ohio Wesleyan. People know where I went to college. No, no, no. I, I went to the original old school 1831 Wesleyan. The real Wesleyan. So, the, the Wesleyan University. So clearing up all you know, confusion. We're not Connecticut. It's just Wesleyan. Yeah, we're not Connecticut Wesleyan. No, yeah, just. Not Virginia just, Wesleyan, just Wesleyan. Just Wesleyan. Got it. So, and, and now, actually, another question here from uh, Hunter Spielman. Um, Is he on the old name team? We got to have that guy on the old name team right there. That's a good name. And he's, he's got a question saying, do you think the MLL, um, NLL, and LXM should follow the same rules as NCAA? And I think more so that – to reshape the question, do you think that the MLL uh, and LXM Pro should follow the same rules as, as NCAA? I guess the uh, L- yes and no. Where where do I even start to begin? Uh, two point line is a fantastic addition to pro lacrosse. I played in a couple of tournaments with it. It's a lot of fun, and those guys can straight up shoot. It does stretch defenses. In the MLL, I just had a light blowout. That was wow. crazy. That was amazing. Yeah. That's like the Super Bowl. <laughs> it is. It's kind of like my own personal. You got Beyonce over there or what? There's a lot. Yeah, yeah, no. Beyonce, we got all kinds of stuff he, going on. He is on. in my Brooklyn. Is little... <laughs> yeah, you know, power surge, New Orleans, you never know. Wow. That's two two blackouts in one week. I know. that This one may be more epic than what we The content is too hot. That's why. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, we'll... Uh, but, you know, just to, just to chime in on what you're talking about, I, I think that ultimately, no. You know, <laughs> it, it's kind of tough to, to impose those rules on the professionals. You know, I think it's a little different because, you know, the point of those rules was to encourage more transition and, you know, more more free play. And I, I don't think that, you know, the, the – the players at the professional level, whether it's indoor in the NLL, outdoor in the MLL or, or LXM, are necessarily horribly adversely affected by playing with these sticks. You know, those games are all pretty exciting as is. So, so I don't think the intention, you know, is, is as well uh, as well intended there. You know, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you. I mean, I like the two point line. I wouldn't mind seeing. You know, I do go to an MLL game once in a while, and I see some defensive checks that just blow my mind with their viciousness. I mean, almost 360 degree slash checks. And I mean, I know that those guys are good, but man, I just, sometimes I see that. And I'm like that, that, that's almost taking it too far. You know, that, that's a slash. But, but you mean game. that in the sense that the ball is not coming out as a result of that, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you're just wailing on some guy's shoulder as hard as you can, I mean, to me, to me that's a pretty obvious penalty, no matter no, no, what league course, you're playing. No, of course, of course, but, the, but the guy is asking, he's saying, do we think that those stick rules should be applied? And I guess what I'm saying is if if the ball isn't coming, you know, if, if players are ho- able to hold through that, you know, that that's a different yeah, issue. No, I, don't think the ball, I don't think the ball is coming out, you know? And, and you're saying that because so I, of the I wouldn't mind if you – I mean, I think pocket has something to do with it. I think school right. has something to do with it. You know, it's like I, I was never thinking that the college guys who had deep pockets were skill-less. Uh, you know, I was just saying they could use maybe use some more skill. Um, you know, the guys in the MLL, I mean, you can't doubt their skill level. You know, right. that, that's really not possible. But if the ball rarely, rarely comes out of a stick check, you know, as a defender and, you know, as a former defender, as a defender yourself, Mark, if the ball's not coming out of a stick – what are you going to do to the guy? Whack him even harder. <laughs> Whack him. You know. So I'm just saying it, it does devolve to that a little bit. So I, I think the MLL right, could be like cognizant of those stick rules. Yeah, but, I mean, like you said, you know, you, you yeah, can't. Yeah, just be, you gotta be realistic. 
Right, but you, you know, you just said you kind of at, at refs at the NESCAC level to be able to to legislate the game well. I hope the refs at the pro game are able to legislate the game well and you know accurately call fouls. I mean, clearly, you know, they let more go. No question about that. Um, you know, the one thing that I that I would say yeah, about you know the, the difference that. between the sticks at the pro. Did we lose Mark over there, Connor? I think we still got Mark here. Pro. Yeah. Last thing know. he said was I can't pro. See him. So we'll probably get back to that when Mark logs back on. Um, but a couple more comments coming in. Wanted to address one from what a Boz 117 uh, He was the one who actually said that you went to Wesleyan. He said, knew it. Connor, you mentioned it in some of your articles. I read all of them. So I am proud of that. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm particularly prob I'm probably too proud yeah. that I went to Wesleyan. That's a that's a fair. Absolutely, but it was so, a great school. I really I enjoyed my time there. So, are they the mules? We got to go mules as well. That's Colby. That's that's that. Yeah, they're up in Maine now. Okay, so, and that's where Whit McCarthy actually played from the Alex M Pro Tour. That is where Whit McCarthy. Played. Yeah. Absolutely true. Whit's a great guy. So, uh, a question here from from Kevin Rowan. Um, you know, to kind of, to, I guess, wrap up the, the discussion on the rules, regardless of whether the rules are good or not, do you think that they have implemented too many rules too fast? Yes. Oh, Mark, you're back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and with an word, answer like that. Yeah, with an yeah, answer right? like that, he's, he's coming in hot. <laughs> it's New York. I can't help it. Yeah. Um, yeah, in a word, yes. I mean, without going into it too much, you know, I think that everybody would agree that changes were needed, and there and there was no question the rules committee was going to act. And in fact, you know, Connor and I had sat down in, in a lacrosse show, I guess, early last summer around U you know, nineteen time when we were talking about you know kind of what we thought going into those committee meetings, what we might see. And in my opinion, this is far and away much more than what anybody anticipated. So. You know, I, I do think they went a little too far, but it, it's still too early to tell whether or not they were ultimately good or bad. I mean, we've only had one D1 game at this point, so I'm not going to rush to conclusions. But I would have liked to see this phased in a little bit more over time. And you know, the same way we were talking about, you know, having all these comments um, or, or, or all these kind of changes that were made last Friday, you know, that that's indicative of them not necessarily being prepared and not having enough time to to work everything through and you know I, I guess they they know that because now you're having those resulting glitches so you know that's that's my answer on that front yeah so, I mean my answer is no they didn't put in too many rules at once you know I, I think you're gonna run into problems and I'd honestly rather see more changes kinda put in at once if need be but yes I was shocked that they put this many changes in. I, I really did not think that was going to happen. I mean, like we talked mm -hmm. about, you know, over the summer, I did not foresee them making this many changes to yeah, the no game. Um, you know, I thought a couple of small ones getting rid of the sideline horn. Boom. We're good. You know, I mean, it, I that's what I was thinking. So um, it shows you I have no idea what the rules committee is thinking. That's proof right there. Well, there you have it. and uh... More proof. Hunter Hunter Spielman is back and wants a shout out for Tosh Point oh tonight. Um, shout out for Tosh Point oh. I don't know. And that let's see. I, I really like this question uh, from Jared Rubin. What are your views on people thinking that New Yorkers are rude, considering you guys are New Yorkers? I'm also from New York, says Jared Rubin. New York is the center yeah, of the universe, up, Jared? Jared. Everybody knows that. <laughs> That's great. I'm not a native. I'm not a native New Yorker. I grew up. I grew up in a, a small town, <clears throat> Minnesota. A small town called Minnesota, and we just lost Connor as well. He's gonna hop back no, no. on. Con Connor's from Massachusetts, actually. <laughs> he's from Minnesota, I think. Right, Mark? No, no. He's from he, Connor's <laughs> from Massachusetts. He's from outside Boston. We we definitively call those people mass holes here in New York. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> All right. Well. Let's see. It looks like Connor is back with us, at least in a second. He will be. And uh, we had a question, Mark, and I know that you guys yeah. were interested in, in talking about uh, a question that came in from the earlier part of this show uh, was asking about the NALL. Sure. And uh, just just to ask if we could talk a little bit about the NALL. And, and, uh, no question. 
I, know, I love just, the NLL. I think uh, everybody kind of wants to know what is the NALL. So, would you like me to describe what it is and kind of Please. what the what the plan is? Absolutely. So, yeah. So the the NALL, if I if I remember the acronym correctly, is the North American Lacrosse League, and you know basically it's a uh, an indoor box league that's uh, set up right now primarily in kind of smaller cities here on the East Coast. Um, right now there are four teams: the uh, the Rhode Island Kingfish, the Boston Rock Hoppers the Baltimore Bombers, and the Louisville Stick Horses. And um, basically the whole premise of the league seems to be getting more American field players into the box game kind of with a, I, I guess, subversive idea of, of making the box game uh, more accessible to the American market and, and also kind of have an avenue for American players to um, learn the box game, maybe in hopes of them transitioning to take on more of a role in the NLL, the, the overall professional league. Um, and so far, the NALL attempted to start last year. Um, that was a little bit of a mess. I know they were only able to have a couple games, mostly exhibitions. Um, but now that they're having their first official season, I've heard nothing but amazing things, both from the quality of the play on the field um, and, and also the response to the teams. I mean, from what I understand, a lot of these games are selling out. And... You know, I, I think that some of the other leagues, including the MLL and the NLL, might might learn a thing or two, um, because the NL, the NALL hasn't gotten too big for its britches. Like a lot of these these teams are playing in in smaller arenas and packing them. You know, they're filling them with you know not necessarily huge crowds, but around a thousand people are coming out. Um, and you know, clearly they have some traction here. Uh, you know, it's it's only been a couple weeks, but the action I've seen has been. Pretty good, and, and, and I'm a pretty keen observer of box lacrosse, and I, I, I'm actually kind of more of a fan of the NALL model of, or style of play box lacrosse-wise than I am the NLL, which is a little slower these days. The NALL is much more up and down the field, much more transition-oriented, um, and, and part of that is due to the predominantly American players that are into it and their field background. Um, but they're high-scoring games. I, I know that uh, Boston, for the past two weeks, has scored over 20 goals. You know, that's not so common in the NLL. Um, and part of it is they're employing some pretty big-name players that are in the league. So, like, I know Chaz Woodson just made his season debut playing for Louisville last weekend. Louisville's a team that has a couple MLL stars on there. Um, and only good things I have to say about the NALL. It, it seems to be really competitive, and they seem to be doing things right now that they've kind of figured out some of their earlier issues, and, and I'm glad they're past that. So do you see it as a, as a developmental league for Americans to, I guess, break into the NLL? I, I do and I don't. You know, I know that they say that they expressly say that that's not their goal, but at the same time, you know, let's not kid ourselves. The NLL, the NLL will certainly watch the NALL, especially, you know, games that are available online in order to do scouting. I mean, it's the same concept with, you know, Division One recruiting. Basically, if you're a good player and you're out there, you know, the coaches will find you. So, you know, I think it's the type of thing where maybe now those, you know, NLL coaches will have to pay more attention to the, uh, the product or, or the players coming out of the NALL, not just rely on, you know, the junior Canadian leagues as much. And, um, you know, to an extent, I think it's viable, um, specifically in the transition role, kind of, kind of where the American field midfielder really seems to excel. Um, I don't necessarily think that NLL GMs are going to be mining for offensive talent, but they might be looking for that athletic defender or that athletic transition guy that can bring the ball up the field, you know, show some toughness. I certainly think that you'll see a couple guys from NALL eventually make um, the uh, the NLL roster, it's similar to the same way you've seen a few of the CLAX guys, you know, the Canadian league that's kind of akin to the NALL, uh, make some NLL rosters and, and vice versa. You might even see some some former, and we have actually, there are some former NLL players in the NALL. So, I mean, I guess time will tell, but we're only a couple games in. I think it's a little early to to expect guys to make that transition, but maybe after the season, you know? Right. Connor, are you back on with us? I feel like I'm back on. doesn't look like he's back on yet, but I know he probably has some thoughts um, on the NALL as well. Some questions coming in uh, about the different positions. You did just bring up some positions, um, you know, in, in box lacrosse. Sure. And I know that there's a, there's a question here. 
um, asking if there is a position in the NLL or in the box game for a FOGO, for a, for a face-off, yes. I guess. Yes, yes, there is, but um, it's not a true FOGO role the same way it is in field lacrosse. So guys that do play FOGO in field, you know, specifically uh, Jeff Snyder and his brother Bob Snyder, kind of play that FOGO type of role. Um, but at the same time, they're technically labeled on their rosters as transition players. Um, and it's really unfair of me to label Jeff Snyder as just being a, uh, a FOGO because he definitely plays much more of the, uh, the transition game than, than he does just FOGO. Um, but there are guys that do kind of just, just face off. But you, um, more so than in, uh, in the NCAA, you have to be prepared to play at least some defense. Um, but, you know, it's kind of perfect for that, that old-school midfielder role. Like a guy that I think would be really successful would be uh, Chase Carl from Denver. I think that he would be perfect for the box game because you know, he's able to drop in, play some defense. He's able to pop one forward, score some goals. You know, you have to be able to mix it up to an extent. Just being a pure FOGO is really tough. And, and the other thing to, to mention about that is box lacrosse rosters are generally very small. Um, you know, most teams will have about 18 what they call runners, and, and the runners consist of the offensive and defensive players. So basically in box lacrosse, you have the offensive guys coming out of the front door or the offensive door that's, that's the closest to the net that they're attacking, and then you have you know, the defensive and the transition players coming out the back door you know, towards the goal that they're defending. Um, and, and you have to kind of have some aptitude towards playing either one of those two sides rather than just being a dedicated FOGO because there's no way with 18 guys on the roster that they'll be able to keep somebody that all they can do is just face off. You've got to bring a little more to the table than that. Right. And, you know, we did talk before about, you know, specialized positions in NCAA sure. and how the horn was kind of eliminating that. I thought, you know, and it is kind of going, NCAA is moving a little bit more to that, that box style of transition of kind of subbing yeah. on the fly. Yeah, so. exactly. And, and that's what Connor was touching on with the, uh, with, with the boxes being longer. So, so I don't know if your readers or your readers, your viewers are, are familiar with how, um, the transition kind of works in box lacrosse, but if you've ever watched the game, you'll notice that in front of the benches, pardon me as I try to draw with my hand right here. Yeah, go ahead, draw it. <laughs> in, front of, in front of each team's bench, or actually from in front of both benches, there, there's a little box that's called, like the, I guess, the transition box. You know, pardon me, Canadians, for not knowing the actual term. But basically how it works is you don't have to run all the way to your bench to change like you do in hockey, right? So in hockey, you have to at least be right in front of your bench or climbing over the boards for another player to jump on. How it works in box lacrosse is as soon as you touch the transition tape, so you could touch the tape in front of the other team's bench and a guy could jump out your far back door. I know that sounds kind of kind of crazy, but yeah. that that's what I think is going to happen in, in the field lacrosse game. So, you know, with, with the boxes being extended, right. you'll see guys kind of running off the field at the closest point on their defensive side. And then as soon as they get off the field, what will happen is an offensive player who's now an extra 20 yards down the field, still in the box, will jump on. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm trying to convey? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's – and that's what we were expecting with that, that extended box. Yeah. So – no, you're right. I, th I think it's a really apt comparison to compare, you know, this new field box situation to to what kind of happens in the uh, in the indoor box game. Um, and it, what will actually be even more interesting now that we're kind of thinking about it and extrapolating is, you know, whether you're going to have some extra man penalties um, and, and stuff like that. A lot of stuff that you don't necessarily commonly see in, in the NCAA game, but, but maybe now with the extended box and, you know, it being a little more helter-skelter than it has been in the past, you know, you might see some of those type of, uh, you know, ticky-tack kind of technical fouls being called. Right. Okay, well, uh, just talk to Connor. Looks like Connor is going to try and uh, hop back on here. So, Connor will be back soon. We got a, a question here from Laxstringer44 wondering what were our first sticks. So, Mark, what what was your first stick? Maybe you could give us a little bit of background of where you grew up playing lacrosse. Um, you know, what position you play, where you went on to play, and everything like that. Sure. Um, so I'm actually from Westchester County, New York, which is kind of like the suburbs of New York City. Um, a lot of people would probably know it in lacrosse parlance as Hudson Valley. Uh, some famous programs in that area are Yorktown High School, which I'm sure you've heard of, or Lakeland Pan S. Those are, those are two programs that have produced tons of college All-Americans, specifically at Syracuse. 
Um, I'm actually from a little closer to the city. I actually went to high school in the Bronx, of all places. I know that. When, <laughs> I know when I say that, people get a little stunned. Um, but my first stick, I started playing in 1996, 1997, excuse me. And I actually, I'll, I'll never forget going to Sports Authority to pick up my first stick. So I started playing in seventh grade. We didn't, even though I'm from Westchester and kind of a hotbed of the sport of lacrosse, we didn't have a, a youth program in my town. So I didn't start playing until we had the middle school team. And my first stick was a, uh, a laser high wall, traditional. Now, we're talking about back in the days when, when most sticks came factory strung with traditional. In fact, it was rare for anything to come uh, you know, with mesh, especially out of the factory. And if it did come with mesh, it'd probably be soft mesh. Um, so I had a laser high wall with the traditional. And I even had, I had the doweled, you know, the doweled uh, heads or the, right. or the doweled shaft. I had one of those. Um, and I, I love that thing to death. I still have it. Um, but it, it was tough. I mean, I, I'll, I'll never forget being in the locker room and somebody brought in the uh, the first Lacrosse Unlimited catalog that, that I'd ever seen, you know, with all the dies and the string jobs and everything and just totally blown away, you know, being somewhat, somewhat ignorant to really what was going on in Lacrosse at the time. And it was just like, whoa, like, what is this? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that level of personalization. Hey, so, you guys, uh, hear me? Yeah. Connor, are you there? Uh -huh. At least he got audio. It looks like Connor's, Connor's trying real hard to get back on right now. So, you know, I think we'll, we'll see him if he pops back on. Uh, hoping to get him on soon. But to talk about, you know, I, I grew up out here in Los Angeles. Sure. Um, played high school across here in Los Angeles, which is, you know, it, it, it was starting to, to come about at the time. It was still, you know, a confusing time. A lot of people were asking me what was that tennis racket I was holding in my hand. Um, nobody had really seen the game out here. So it, it was exciting to start playing. I had no idea what kind of stick to get. I just looked to my coach and to some of the seniors on my team. Uh, I actually played on a first-year team. So I think oh, wow. it was – or actually, I know what it was. It was a Brian F-15 with a uh, – I think a Brian Matrix head, if it was Oh, a, okay. Yeah, nice. Yeah. That's what it was. And it was actually an F-15 uh, power – so, I don't oh, know. You jump right in. You had the good stuff. Oh yeah, I had the good stuff. So, uh, and and by the way, I think we do have a uh, uh, Connor with us. Um, for some reason, I, we're having a, really a, a little bit of a tough time with him. But uh, those lights, it's that New Orleans power. It's got to be the blackout that he experienced, the Super Bowl blackout. That's uh, Beyonce. That's, she's still working it, man. She's killing it out here. Right. Experience. Like so, on yeah, Connor, if you're with us, give us a little shout. What's happening? So, Connor, we were, we were talking about what our first stick was, and I was kind of relating how, you know, back, back in the, uh, the good old days, I had a, uh, a laser high wall, you know, with the traditional factory stringing, but I had the, uh, the dowel shaft. Do you remember what your first the, stick was? I had the exact same stick. Yeah. Yep. Pink yeah, and, and green it, traditional. Yeah, and it came in at the respectable thirty-five dollars off the rack. So I think that that's what my parents' real interest was. You know, get get something cheap, see if see if I stick with it, and then uh, I, I quickly upgraded from there. Like I was telling uh, Samir, you know, I got the uh, I saw the first Lacrosse Unlimited catalog in my uh, in my middle school locker room and saw the stringing and die jobs, and I went from a uh, a laser high wall to a uh, a revolution with my school team die in a nice five diamond traditional pocket real quick. Wow! That wow, that's a big step up, though. It, it was tough. It had way too much whip. That thing started to bag on me in no time. I had like six shooting strings in there, you know, Dan Dawson style, one on top of the other. It wasn't pretty. It, it was pretty rough. <laughs> that's amazing, Connor. What are you using these days? Uh, I've got two heads that I use. They're both traditional. One's uh, an Eastern Core head, and the other is an Under Armour Mercenary. Uh, oh, I like them. They're good. What do you think yeah. about the new Under Armour products? Huge step up from last year's offering. No question about it. Huge step yeah. up. Yeah. You, I haven't had a yeah, chance no, to I'm, get I'm, my hands I'm, on them, but I'm intrigued. Yeah. No, it looks good. It's it's kind of sticking up to uh, you know a lot of the box across abuse that it's getting. Uh, from a lot of their testing, they've got a lot of Canadians working for Team 22, and um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, last year I think people had their doubts, but they rebounded really nicely. Um, you know, the gloves are are much better. I saw a pair of those over at the Trilogy headquarters, and uh, you know, they were they were really pretty good. So, 
uh, you know, I, I think Under Armour's made a, a big, big, big time stride in, in only one year. Yeah, you know what? I'm I'm interested to find out. I mean, from what I understand, Team Twenty Two is is a licensee relationship, and, and it seems that Kurt Steyer is, you know, the, the big man in lacrosse right now. Uh, you know, if people aren't familiar with who he is, Kurt Steyer's is an an, an Onondaga businessman. You know, who owns the Hamilton Nationals and and the Rochester Nighthawks. He seems to be the main driving force behind Team Twenty Two, and actually, a couple guys who used to be major in the lacrosse industry are now associated with him. I mean, from what I understand, Tom Marichek and Paul Gate are the guys that are really behind the, the Under Armour product. I mean, is that true? That's what I understand, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's not all coming directly from inside Under Armour. They've done a great job of finding a, you know, sort of a subcontractor who can handle the lacrosse world for them. Um, and it seems to be going really well. I mean, you know, it takes a little time, but they've been able to rebound really quickly. I think that, you know, that history that you talked to speaks to why they have so many uh, Canadian endorsed athletes, but right. they got a lot of good guys, and you know I think that again that's a strong foundation um, going out and trying to find somebody to you know kind of do the work because it's very specific work, right? I mean the lacrosse industry is different from anything yeah, else. You can't just be there. a manufacturer <laughs> and, and show up, no question. Well, if there's actually some controversy about that. I mean I don't really mean to delve into a larger topic, but I'll never forget reading the article on Inside Lacrosse where um, it, it looks like there's a situation right now where Warrior is, is suing Under Armour, actually, you know, in, in connection with you know, their lacrosse production. It looks like a former Warrior employee or Warrior Brian employee, you know, at least the allegations that I saw in the article, and, and then when I pulled up the, the lawsuit, it contends that he stole their like, you know, entire business plan or you know, whatever information that he formerly had from you know, working at Brian Warrior. I mean, who knows what, what impact that actually is, but that's certainly something to keep an eye on moving forward uh, you know, to see how that all shakes out. I mean, there's no question that you know, Warrior has been a litigious company and, and been very judicious in, in protecting their trademarks. But to me, those, those are pretty serious allegations, and you know, if proven true, that would be that would be pretty ridiculous, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know enough about that specific situation to really comment on it. You know, I don't know if this guy's a uh, uh, Under Armour guy or Team Twenty Two guy, or if he doesn't work there anymore. If he if they knew about it, I mean, I, I don't know anything, you know, other than what I've read in that brief, which is really pretty basic. So, um, yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out. Well, no, for sure. I mean, especially with them gaining some traction, you know. I mean, I, I'm I'm anxious to see their products live and in person myself. But you know, it's weird that lacrosse is becoming that much of a, of a big business thing like this. But it, it's only good for the sport, in my mind. Well, I mean, to me, every lawsuit, uh, you know, the money to pay for those has to come from somebody somewhere. Um, right. And if it's coming from lacrosse companies, then they have to make that up. So I think at a certain point, lawsuits start to add on costs. Uh, to us, you know, the the users and purchasers of this stuff, um, you know. But at another point, you know, if it's about protecting intellectual property, you know, there there is a market and there's a there's a set of laws in the United States for that. So that's kind of life. Yeah. No. For sure. For sure. Well, you want to uh, you want to hit up some weekend upsets? I can run down a list of all the D1 games this weekend. Maybe. Uh, yeah, why not? Winners. Let's delve into the crystal ball a little bit. All right, let's go crystal ball. We'll go a little bit crazy. First one up, I think uh, this has a, the matchup to possibly be the, the game of the weekend. Um, Bryant at uh, Bryant versus Colgate. Oh wow, diving right in. Well, I mean, you, you know from when we were talking earlier that that I love the Bryant Bulldogs going into this season, but uh, I don't know, man. That that's pretty tough. You got the reigning Tuaraton Trophy winner and Peter Baum. You got uh, what's his name Cunningham back on uh, on the left side there. Um, you know they even Colgate even returns their goalie who started the playoff game. Um, this is definitely going to be a competitive game, no question. And and you're right, there's certainly upset potential there. Yeah, I mean I think Pressler's doing some good stuff in Rhode Island, and uh, Bryant has uh, the automatic qualifier this year with the NEC if they can win that. So you know, I think that they're kind of itching to make this their true breakout year in D1. Um, could yeah. be it, but I, I think you're going to get a good game there either way. I'd, I'd probably – I'll go with the upset. I'll, I'll take Bryant. Why not? Yeah, sure. Well, it's going to be cold up there, one. too. I mean, either way, whether it's Hamilton, New York, or Rhode Island, it's going to be a tough game. <laughs> yeah. We got uh, 
I, I agree, without a doubt. Duke Denver should be good. Yeah, Duke Denver is going to be amazing. Um, I got to be honest, I'm I'm going with the uh, w- with Denver here. You know, talking about the new rules and, and teams that are really going to benefit. I think that Denver. I'm, I'm not going to call them a dark horse team because obviously they've been coming on really strong in recent years. But I I think that they could very easily return to Final Four form this year. You know, especially with the the Canadian presence that they have and getting up and down the field. I mean, I know you know Duke returns a lot of players and and, and they have a lot of depth defensively, even without Casey Carroll, but mm-hmm. I still like Denver in this game. All right, all right. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a big... For me, Duke is one of those teams that by the end of the season, they're flying high, no matter what. True. Uh, but early they on, they the can game, drop a game here and there. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that can happen, you know, but for me, it's more about them kind of focusing on what's important at the end of the year as opposed to what's important at the beginning of the year. Um, so I, I'd take Denver as well in that one, but you know it's going to be interesting either way, no matter Where what happens. Where are this one? Do you know? No, I'm not sure actually. Off the top because of my head, I, I remember, remember the past couple of years, Duke stumbled out of the gate against UPenn. I mean, it's not a stumble against Notre Dame, but you know Duke was certainly ranked higher than Notre Dame was going into that game last year. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they are a little susceptible. I, I would say they're a little more susceptible early than late. You know, yeah. I'd rather play Duke early in the year than late in the year. I'd probably rather not play them at all. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Because they would kill me. Uh, next up, I think, uh, you know, St. Joseph's is on the up and up. I don't think they're going to overcome the Lehigh Mountain Hawks this weekend. That one's looking a little doubtful. Uh, well, there's an interesting but, relationship there. The The coach of the uh, the St. Joe, um, Joe's is Taylor Ray, if, if I remember correctly, and Taylor Ray was a college teammate of Kevin Cassis. I mean, you know, them being, uh, who's the coach at Lehigh, them being coached geographically, I'm sure, is part of the matchup, but I'm, I'm sure those coaches schedule that game so they can, uh, you know, see each other and, and compare notes. But you're right. I, I think Lehigh's poised for big things this year. I don't think that St. Joe's has made enough strides to, to get past the Mountain Hawks. No, I don't think that they're going to win the game, but I think it might be a little more competitive than people think initially. Uh, St. Joe's, I think, is definitely one of those kind of programs on the rise, or at least with a lot of potential. Yeah, I mean, they're, uh, they're in that Philly hotbed, no question. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, I think UMass and Army could be a great game, A, because UMass won a lot of games last year, but they won a lot of close games. And the other reason is, you know, sure, Will Manny is back, but Army also has Brendan Buckley. And I'm really hoping that those two guys match up against each other uh, because, for me, Manny is one of the top, three attackmen in the nation, and Buckley is probably one of the three top defensemen in the country. Um, I'm excited to see to see those two go head-to-head if they do. Yeah, and, and, and even, even extrapolating on that further, I think both of their styles really match up well. You know, Manny's kind of a, a quick jitterbug type of guy, and Buckley's an excellent cover defenseman, doesn't throw a ton of checks. You know, he's not a, uh, a Bill or Tim Henderson, you know, kind of moving all over the field. He's He's a steady, consistent body position defender. So this could definitely be a tough one for uh, for Will Manny. And, you know, a lot of people might be quickly uh, anointing uh, UMass the winner here. Um, but they have, you know, a transition in goal. You know, they're talking about maybe starting Oliveri, the uh, the redshirt freshman. And, and Army, look, they're a team you got to look out for, especially early in the season because there's no question, no question. that the, – the cadets yeah. are in shape always. You know, I mean, anytime you play a service academy, you better believe that they're going to be better conditioned than you are. And, you know, they, they not only return some upper-class senior talent in Buckley and, and Garrett Thull, but they also have the advantage of having the, the Army prep school. And, uh, you know, if I remember correctly, they have a couple guys who were pretty highly ranked recruits that went through Army prep and are, and are now possibly ready to show on, on the big stage here. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I think between Army and and, uh, and Navy and even Air Force, I mean, talk about an up-and-comer. You know, the service academies are, are always bringing the A-game when it has to do with athletes and being in top shape and playing very disciplined disciplined ball. Um, so I think that should be a good game. Um, I, I think UMass is going to squeak it out. Yeah, I got Army in that one. Uh, Army, Army's, they're, they're located in my, my home area, Westchester County, so I can't go against them. No, I mean, and you know what? Honestly, I think that that's a really solid pick. Um, I think that they're they're a very good team, but you know, I gotta I gotta go with UMass. I, I think that they're gonna go Homer. Out. They got a couple Homer. Homer. Yeah, you know, Massachusetts. What? That's fine. That that'll be the battle of the lacrosse show right there. Army versus UMass. UMass, do me proud. Come on, baby. 
Um, the last one I'm going to talk about, I don't think it's going to be as much of a close game, but I think in terms of the future of the sport, you know, the future of D1 lacrosse, does it get any bigger than Michigan-Penn State? No, that's that's a great point. And, and actually, I'm a huge <laughs> University of Michigan fan. <laughs> there you go. So are you picking Michigan in the upset? No, no, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not ready to go that far. You know, I, I'm really impressed with what Tambroni has done down at Penn State, and I mean, that's a team that realistically may have even, sh you know, they they should have been in the tournament last year. They had a lot of quality wins, a great schedule. I mean, they're arguably the first team out, and you know, to put to compare them to. Uh, year two or team two at Michigan, I don't think that Michigan is quite yet there yet. Um, you know, I'm sure they probably have a, uh, a lot of underclassmen that we're not familiar with that are going to be seeing some playing time. You know, there's, there's no question that Michigan's been able to go out and get themselves some good recruits in, in a really short amount of time. But I don't think that they're ready to uh, compete with the uh, with the Nittany Lions, and, and more important than that, Austin Cout, the goalie for for Penn State, you know, he has the potential to be the first team All America goalie this year, and and I don't think that Michigan's necessarily ready for what he brings. Um, interestingly, that game might be being played indoors at Penn State's facility, so that might have an effect. I mean, I know Michigan practices indoors in a uh, an Osterbahn Fieldhouse, so it might not necessarily be an advantage either way, but. You're right. That should be a great game. Yeah, I mean, you know, I got to pick Penn State for me. They are really the, uh, they're really the key, uh, you know, possible potential top ten, you know, newcomer. You know, they're a team I could see winning a uh, national championship. Yeah, agreed. I mean, national championship might be might be a little bit of a stretch, but I like them to make the playoffs, especially coming out of their league. No question. It looks like Connor might have just been uh, been booted off. He's coming back right now. <laughs> Connor? Oh, man. Oh, man, this is killing me. I'm sorry, guys. But, so, yeah, I mean, uh, for me, Michigan is a, a team on the rise, but Penn State's a team that's on the rise and really there now. Um, and I, I think that they're obviously going to win this game. But I think this is definitely a game to watch uh, in the future and, and should be really exciting. So, yeah, especially uh, with the Big Ten. You know, the Big Ten yeah. Conference, they're really close yeah, to having – having an automatic qualifier. And th this could be a, a great matchup for years to come, and this could really be indicative of, of what this series might hold for lacrosse fans for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, next week, you know, uh, we'll be back, and, and I think we should actually talk about the Big Ten uh, a lot more next week. That, that sounds like a great topic to kind of lead with. Um, but we'll be back on here uh, next week. We're going to wrap things up now, 8 p.m. Tuesdays, Lacrosse Network. It's the lacrosse show. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, thanks for your comments. Really appreciate everything and bearing with not being able to see my beautiful face. I know it's a tough life, but thank you, guys. Thanks, everybody. Camera one, camera two.